the shooting range. In this episode, pages of history, one a day in Tampa Bay, triathlon, comparing new top MBTs, and metal beasts, the most formidable yet. Let the spring parade of new vehicles begin. And the plane that opens it today is one with a truly unenviable fate. It showed great promise, but tough times disrupted the engineer's hopes. We could only guess now what the development of such a unique machine could have led to. Still, we can give it a second chance in War Thunder. Please welcome the first ever supersonic VTOL fighter jet, the Yak-141. This plane's power plant includes two lift and one lift cruise engine with an afterburner and a thrust vectoring nozzle. Self-sealing fuel tanks are found in the fuselage. The nose hides the radar and optical systems, while a spot below the left air intake shows us the forward-firing 30mm autocannon. This fighter can also carry conventional bombs and rockets, gun pods, and of course, guided air-to-air -air missiles. The Yak-141 managed to set quite a few records in reality. Its ambitions in War Thunder are just as high. This fighter can boast the most powerful engine in the game, capable of pushing above 15-ton forces in afterburner mode. With a couple of lift turbines, we got ourselves a new record in total thrust output. In practice, such a power plant makes this Yak one of the most dynamic and fastest climbing fighters in the game. Its maximum speed, however, is pretty modest if compared to fourth-generation machines. The new fighter can carry up to four R-27 missiles. No other plane in the Soviet tech tree is capable of this. That's why we recommend against close-range AAMs on this beast. As for the homing-type choice, it's up to you. We'd only like to say a few words about each of them. The radar-guided ER missiles have a longer range and a higher speed, but require a constant highlight from the onboard radar, which means your enemy will know they're targeted in advance. The infrared homing missiles look less impressive, but you can aim them discreetly with the help of the optical system. And the only way your enemy can spot them is by paying attention and using flares on time. If the choice seems too hard, you can make a mixed loadout and rate the efficiency and comfort of each type in a single battle. The tactics for the Yak-141 are similar to any other top fighter jet with a great radar and medium-range missiles. Now, does the thrust vectoring nozzle give it any edge in close combat? Both yes and no. In large-scale air battles with lots of enemies around, lowering your speed is begging for a ticket to the hangar screen. In one-on-one -on -one duels, however, timely usage of thrust vectoring can be quite handy. As for strike capabilities, this yak can only employ unguided weaponry. You can hunt ground targets, of course, but only as long as there are no enemy anti-air systems around. If you expect to see them on the battlefield, you'd be better off playing the interceptor role. Here's the B-26 Marauder, a plane that earned a reputation in the aviation units. This reputation, however, is pretty questionable. The aircraft received a number of nicknames, including such spotlights as the Flying Coffin or the Widowmaker. It was famously hard to control and had a whimsical character. But the most notable part is the number of accidents. It was so high that it became proverbial among the pilots. One can't help but ask, why did the army continue to use it in spite of all this? Why was it even developed in the first place? After all, the United States Army scrapped less infamous projects and discontinued vehicles with fewer issues before. Did the U.S. Air Force have no alternative for this plane? Well, no, they had the B-25 Mitchell that made pilots who previously flew on the Marauder really happy. There was also the Havoc, a plane so similar to the B-26 that inexperienced people wouldn't even be able to tell them apart. Now, there is another absolutely wild idea stating that the Martin Company was losing its leading position in the market. 
so the American army took pity on it and awarded it the project. That's not true, of course. Even if the army wanted to do that, they could have ordered some other planes like the B-25 or the A-20. But it wouldn't have worked anyway. Martin was at capacity. Their Maryland lost to Douglas and North American in a competition but still made it to mass production, so the company was busy making them 24-7 for the French Air Force. So we're back at square one. What was it about the Marauder that made the military keep it around all the way until the invaders came by, planes from a completely new generation? Well, it looks like the B-26 was indispensable due to a number of unique advantages that were so useful they outweighed the numerous flaws. Yeah, the Marauder put a high load on its short wing and thus required a long runway and a high takeoff, landing, or stall speed, which also meant that it could barely be used on unimproved fields. What it could offer instead was a flat dive speed simply unavailable to either the Mitchell or the Havoc. And what's better than whooshing in right above the target at a ludicrous speed and hitting it at point blank with amazing accuracy before the anti-air can sniff anything out? It was that small and short wing that made the high speed possible at low altitudes. Combined with the aerodynamic spindle-shaped body and two strong 18-cylinder radial engines. By the way, the latter were also installed on the Thunderbolts, Hellcats, and Corsairs. Neither the B-25 nor the A-20 could carry engines of such mass and size. Still, that wasn't even the sweetest part. The B-26 had a practical range exceeding 3,000 kilometers, which put it closer to strategic bombers it could perform tasks simply unfathomable for other machines of this class. The Mitchell, for instance, only had two-thirds of this range. And that was a major issue. Colonel Doolittle would confirm this. Meanwhile, the Marauder could take off in Australia, perform confident attacks on Japanese-occupied Papua New Guinea, and even break away from the sluggish Zero fighters. After the Japanese pilots, it was the Germans' turn to learn about this surprising machine. Yes, it was hard to fly, but it also had much less trouble performing on the hardest combat missions. It's been more than three and a half years since the last time we had the main tank triathlon. Judging by your comments, it's high time we organized a new one. Well, here we go. Please welcome. The American Research Tree is represented by the Abrams M1A2 SEP Tusk. Germany sent in a new modification of the previous winner, the Leopard 2A6. The Soviet school is represented by the T80 BVM with an additional protection package. The United Kingdom sent its Challenger 2E, one of the recently added vehicles. The Land of the Rising Sun is represented by the youngest of the participants, the Type 10. China sent its WZ-1001E LCT. Italy chose another new vehicle, the Ariete AMV PT-1. France picked the Leclerc again, but this time it's the S-21. Sweden is represented by the Snowy Leopard, the STRV-122B PLSS. And the last but not the least member of this test is the Israeli Merkava 4M. As usual, the first stage will show the tank's mobility levels. Contestants are allowed to take off additional armor to show their best. Everyone ready? Go! The drivers go to full throttle and only the British vehicle seems to lag a little. By the end of the first leg, the Italian tank is leading. Next, we see the French one, the T-80, and the STRV. The Sands see a fight for third place between the Chinese and the Japanese teams, while the snowy area makes the two leaders lose some steam. The riverbed helps the Ariete take back the lead for a while, but the finish line is close. The Chinese MBT shows the best maximum speed and wins the race. The second place is shared by the Japanese and French teams. Next, we see the T-80, the STRV, and the Challenger. And here's the rest of the race. Now let's check these MBT's armor. We'll be shooting the sub-top 3BM-42 shell at them. 
The Ariete shows the worst result here. Its armor is simply incapable of sustaining this shot. The Israeli tank would have scored higher thanks to its sturdy turret, but its enormous hull is too easy to penetrate. The French and Japanese tanks seem stronger. Their flaws include lower front plates, large gun mantlets giving access to ammo racks, and smaller crews. The WZ-1001 and the T-80 are doing well, but if you hit one of the vulnerabilities, their tight layout and small crews have no chance. The Challenger, Abrams, and Leopard are doing much better. They have their vulnerable areas, but overall, they can deflect a shell and even survive penetration. The best protection is offered by the Swedish machine. Its additional armor certainly does it a favor. The third stage is the shooting part. We've picked a couple of Finnish Leopards for ground targets and put them a kilometer away. We'd also like to give our contestants a moving chopper to hit today. Shot number one, and we have 10 torches here. Yeah, those rounds are certainly top notch. The Japanese tank reloads first and hits the second target right away. The Challenger repeats this result in a second, closely followed by the rest of the tanks. Now for the helicopter part. The American and the Chinese teams switch to proximity fuse rounds, the T-80 crew loads their ATGM, but the rest of the competition has to make do with regular finned shells. The first three quickly complete their tasks, while all the others have to waste quite a few shots. Time to sum up. To be honest, we've never had a harder time choosing a winner before. Their specs are so close we have to go into the tiniest differences. Even so, we had to pick six tanks for three places. So, the bronze is shared by the Japanese Type 10, the German Leopard, and the French Leclerc. One has the fastest reload, another one has a higher pen rate, and the third one is arguably the most balanced tank. The silver goes to the WZ-1001 and the STRV-122B. The Chinese tank has a high speed, a wide choice of ammo, and great auxiliary devices, while the Swedish one offers the best protection level. And the winner, albeit by a tiny margin, is the American Abrams. Its speed and protection aren't perfect, but it offers the most versatile set of characteristics in War Thunder today. Well, let's give some R&R &R to our contestants while we answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called Batiatus1. If you jettison all your bombs and rockets or missiles when you're in a dogfight, are your bombs active and do they explode or not? Hi there! No, if you jettison your ordnance, it's dropped with the fuses off. So if you want to try and score something with it, drop it the regular way. You can try ripple bombing to save time, by the way. Ryan France asks, would you consider adding more East German ground vehicles? Hi, Ryan. The German ground tree is one of the most numerous and various ones on top ranks, so we focus our efforts on other nations there. We still remember the East German vehicles, though. Hope you enjoy the brand new T-72 M1. Another question comes from Slick Ninja Dude. When will ejection seats be added to War Thunder? Hi there! Like, right now! The recent update added ejection seat animations to many top aircraft. Our artist will continue working on this, so expect more aircraft to receive this feature in the future. Isaac Vidales writes, Can you guys do a triathlon of mid-tier attack jets? Like the A-32 Lanson and the Su-7? Hello, Isaac. We've had a triathlon for attack jets with unguided weapons recently. Check out episode 325. We might have another episode with older machines in the future, like the A-32 and the early Su-7. And the last comment for today was written by Toyat. Which part of the map did you land those phantoms in the closing scene of the triathlon part? Hi there! Right on the road, next to the gas station. It had to be cleared up with tanks, but you can certainly land a phantom there. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. 
and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to check the clock on your timed rounds, leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.